to block one, here also you have four units. So continuation of unit four in the first block, you have unit five, six, seven, and eight. So four units are there in block two. So the title is Global Climate, Past, Present, and the Future. So in this block, the first unit, unit five, so it discuss the account of past climate. So how was the climate in the past? It is discussed in unit five. Unit six, it refers to the environmental indicators and instrumental records. Unit seven is human footprints on global warming. That is, see, unit six and seven, so it refers to the present climatic conditions. And unit eight is the future, predicting future climates based on the past and the present climatic conditions. So today we shall discuss the block two, the global climate, past, present, and future. So unit five, it is the past climate, six and seven is the present climate, and eighth one is the future climate. So first let us take up unit five, that is the account of past climate. So how was the climate earlier? See, as we all know, the earth is constantly a changing planet since its formation of around 4.6 billion years ago and its climate is also changes from time to time so we can know the present climate by studying the components of the climate system so predicting its future state in order to predict the future state of the climate we should understand the present and the past climate so in this unit, that is in unit five, so we will discuss the climate of the past, the sources of past climatic conditions and changes in the climatic climate during quaternary period when humans appeared as a dominant biotic element on the earth. So much of the variation in the climate was seen once the origin of life started on earth especially human beings where the human beings played a major role in dominating the climatic conditions so the past climate is also called as the paleo climate paleo means past old so the paleo climate is the past climate and the science deals with the past climate is known as ice cores radiocarbon etc so these are some of the evidences of the past climate so before discussing the past climate, so let us study the geological time scale. So in order to understand the past climate, so we should be familiar with the geological time scale. See, as the time is divided into years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, seconds etc even the geological the table of the geological time period so this is the summary of the geological time scale showing the main time units where it is divided into eon era period epoch and time interval in million years so you have the there are three eons here so the first one is phanerozoic and second one is precambrian so there are two eons 
Phenerozoic and Precambrian. And again, the Phenerozoic is divided into three eras. That is Cenozoic, Mesozoic and Paleozoic. So similarly, the Precambrian is divided into three Proterozoic, Archean and Hadean. So each of the eon is divided into three eras. An era is further divided into periods. So Cenozoic is further divided into Quaternary, Neogene, Paleogene. And similarly, the Mesozoic is divided into Cretaceous, Jurassic and Triassic. Paleozoic is divided into Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician, Cambrian, etc. Then Proterozoic is divided into Neoproterozoic, Mesoproterozoic, Paleoproterozoic. And similarly, the Archean is divided into Neoarchean, Mesoarchean, Paleoarchean, and Eoarchean. So again, these periods, they are further divided into epochs. See, only in the Cenozoic, you can see the division of the periods into epochs. The Quaternary, the Quaternary period is divided into Holocene and Pleistocene. Neogene is Pliocene and Miocene, and Paleogene is Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene. So only the Cenozoic is divided into different epochs. So further Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Proterozoic, Archean, it is not divided into epochs. So if you know this geological time scale, so then we can know how was the climate during that period. So basically, you have the climate during Precambrian. So Precambrian time is 4.6 billion years to 540 million years ago. So during this time, the Earth's climate was warm and the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane and water vapor were very high. So the concentration of carbon dioxide was more than 18 times than its present levels and methane was about 1000 ppm. So the oxygen was not present in the early atmosphere. So after a number of years, the temperature came down to certain degrees and water vapor of the early atmosphere produced rains. So as a result, the earth was provided with the basic necessities such as soil, water and air for the origin of life. So the early forms of life, it was around 3.5 billion years ago and the first life was by the cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria made their first appearance on the surface of the earth. Cyanobacteria, it is also called as the blue-green algae. So these bacteria made their own food by using the energy of the sun and it released oxygen as a byproduct by a process called photosynthesis. So as a consequence, around 600 million years ago, enough oxygen was present in the atmosphere that led to the development of multicellular organisms. So this was the climate during Precambrian. So the climate during the Phenerozoic, that is 542, so I missed out the million years ago, the concentration of the carbon dioxide fluctuated greatly and decreased from 6,000 ppm to the current levels. So the carbon cycle was uh, took a different shape in the Phenerozoic climate and, a result, and as a result, so diverse variation occurred in multicellular organisms and land plants. So the climate shifted frequently between the glacial and the non-glacial greenhouse conditions and the temperature greatly influenced by the natural processes, including breaking and the reunion of continental land masses as well as extraterrestrial impacts during the Phenerozoic time. So the five great mass extinctions had been recorded in the Phenerozoic history of life and they are related to the widespread changes to the past 
climate. So it is noted that in order to study the modern climate, the paleoclimatologists, they used climate archives and proxies to know the past climate of the earth. So what are these climate archives? See, climate archives means the geologic and biological materials that preserve that preserve evidence of past changes in the climate. These are called as climate archives. And the proxies, proxies means the preserved physical characteristics of the environment that can stand in for direct measurements like ice cores, tree rings, sediment cores, etc. So in order to study or in order to know the past climate so paleoclimatologists they used mainly the climate archives and proxies so climate archives are geologic and biological materials of the past and the proxies are the physical characteristics of the environment that can stand in for direct measurement like ice cores tree rings sediment cores etc so the main types of climate archives are there are three important data which gives or which unravels the past climate are historical data, archaeological data and geological record. So these are the three main types of climate archives. So let us study the historical data. Historical data represents the first source of information for reconstructing the past climate. So it consists of documentary data. So the logs of the farmers, dairies of the travelers, ancient inscriptions, newspapers, paintings, the artifacts, the reports of the early weather and other public records are the main source of the historical data. So apart from this, the legal document, written account, tax, economic and pictorial records containing information about land uses, landscape, societal collapse, construction material, and biodiversity also provides an important clue. It gives an important clue for the for reconstructing or the past climate. So second evidence is the archaeological data. See, archaeology deals with the study of the past human cultures, which focuses on the people who lived, worked, traded, and moved in the past. So it also gives us an idea about the lifestyle of prehistoric human, which is influenced, humans which were influenced by the climatic conditions. So archaeological data is considerably older when compared to the historical data. So archaeological site is a place where the where it gives a strong evidence of past human activity, which are preserved, and such evidences are a useful source of cultural and non-cultural information. So some of the data of archaeological data are rock layers, minerals, and soil data. So the chemical, physical, and geological characteristics of the rock layer, mineral, and soil samples, it gives a number of clues of the past climate. So the grain size of the sediment layers and the deposition, they help in the, they help in reconstructing the past climatic conditions. So the sequence of sediment layers near the shore, near shore of archaeological sites, give the information of the changes in the sea level as they contain distinct layers of sediments deposited under marine to freshwater conditions. And plant and animal remains. So the plant remains comprise the plant materials like wood, mature seeds, pollen grains, spores, fruits, flowers, leaves, stems, etc. So the animal remains, it comprises bones and teeth of mammals, fish skeletal remains and shells of invertebrates. 
so the plant and the human life or the biotic life they are they were controlled by climatic conditions and their remains will help us to know their source of food and to reconstruct the climatic and environmental conditions of the past so the carbon nitrogen oxygen isotope analysis of bone and shell remains it gives the information about the paleo diets then paleo temperature paleo means old so the diet the food the temperature and the seasonal patterns and also the existence of mammoth remains consisting of skins and bones clearly specifies a cold climate the artifacts so these are the objects created modified and used by human beings like pottery tools made up of stone wood bone metal decorative objects personal objects etc so it is considered that the prehistoric humans used nearby available material for creating or manufacturing these artifacts so the presence of this broken black and burned clay pots in association with ash layers it is an archaeological site or indicating the warm climate earlier in the past so these these were the some of the evidences of archaeological record so next coming to the geological record so the earth's material account of past climate consisting of different types of rocks like igneous sedimentary metamorphic fossils sediments and soil that are available for study so the this material the material related to the so rocks or the soils it gives us a record which we call it as the rock record and it gives an indirect evidence to reconstruct the earth's climate in the past so the geological record is much older than the historical and archaeological data so what are these sedimentary rocks so uh, we know there are three different types of rocks like the sedimentary igneous and metamorphic so the sedimentary rocks are formed by the slow process of deposition of sediments carried by the rivers and streams after millions of years the soft sediment it gets stratified or get layered into hard rocks so some glacial features have been recognized and it helps as a useful tool in understanding or reconstructing the climate of the past similarly the fossils so fossil remains of the ancient life which are preserved in the sedimentary rocks it gives an uh, evidence of environmental conditions in the past so these fossils gives a valuable clues to know the climate of the past so the presence of the fossil reptiles like lizards and snakes they are the good indicators indicating the presence of warm climate before because they cannot live in cold climate as their body is not able to maintain a constant warm temperature similarly the plant evidences like cycads indicate the tropical and subtropical ancient climate because modern cycads occur in these climatic zones so the study of growth rings see when you cut a tree you see a number of especially the monocot plants you can see a number of rings giving the age of the tree and similarly the corals corals which are present in the deep oceans it tells about the past seasonal variation so these are some of the evidences and ice cores so they include the cores of ice obtained from perennially cold as where no or little melting occurs such as polar regions greenland high mountains of andes himalayas etc and the cave deposits so the cave deposits contains the calcium carbonate deposits consisting of speleotherms which is formed in the limestone cave and they are potential indicator of non glacial terrestrial climate so what was the climate in the quaternary period so the quaternary is the youngest period of the cenozoic era so as we have seen in this geological time scale 
so the quaternary the quaternary period just a minute i'll show you the quaternary period it is the youngest which is divided into two epochs namely the holocene and the pleistocene pleistocene so the historical data includes the or the climate archives it includes the historical data archaeological data and the geological record so the the climate of the quaternary period which is divided into two epochs namely the pleistocene and the holocene so it is a period of greater climatic conditions and the climatic history of the earth since 2.58 million years ago to present is very dynamic because there was a large portion of the earth's surface especially the northern hemisphere parts of antarctica and high mountainous regions repeatedly witnessed a widespread glaciations so this period is also called as the great ice age so the oxygen and carbon isotope ratios growth rings in trees cave and glacial features lakes microfossils pollen grains and ice cores are climate proxies that were commonly utilized to reconstruct the climate in the quaternary period so in the pleistocene the pleistocene which starts from 2.58 million years ago which ends in 11700 years ago so this epoch or the time unit of the geological time scale it showed it was a time of radical climate changes and emergence of human beings so at the close of pliocene and the beginning of the pleistocene there was a shift in global climate at around 2.5 million years ago so human beings evolved during this reach, this uh, uh, epoch so in holocene holocene is the current or the recent interval of geological time scale and it starts with the end of pleistocene and it starts uh, up to the present and continues to the present day it is subdivided into three stages and it is relatively warm period during which human influences had been significantly altered the earth system actually the environment so initially humans altered earth's environment by hunting cutting down the trees farming and later by civilization building towns cities industries extracting natural resources and finally establishing huge networks of transportation and communication systems so in the anthropocene which refers to the age of man so the it is the geology of humanity which focuses on the cumulative role of humans as geological and geomorphic agents in altering the earth's environment by a number of ways through agriculture mining industrialization urbanization or globalization so the anthropocene is still in informal time unit and its beginning is still a matter of debate but many workers believe that it began with the industrial revolution in europe around 1800 years before the present era so the holocene epoch is very important for us because it shows how earth's environment reached to its present form so it experienced different cycles of climate so this is about the first unit so the second block that we are discussing today is the you have four units the first one is the account of past climate so the account of past climate is also called as the paleo climate and it is also called as paleo the study of this past climate is called as paleo climatology and to understand this we should know the geological time scale which is divided which is divided into eon era period epoch and the number of years in million years so then we get the climate during the pre cambrian and during the phenerozoic and the main evidence or the climate archives the climate archives is the geologic 
and biologic materials that preserve evidence of the past changes in the climate or the proxies. Proxies are the direct measurement like ice cores, tree rings and sediment cores. So based on these two evidences, so we can construct or we can unreveal the climate of the past. So the main evidences are historical data, archaeological data and geological record. So the archaeological data includes the layers of the rock, minerals and soil data, the plant and the animal remains, the artifacts and the geological record. It gives an idea of the different types of rock, fossils, sediments, etc. Ice cores, these are the proxies, ice cores, cave deposits, etc. So finally, the climate of the quaternary period. So quaternary is the youngest period of the Cenozoic, which is divided into two epochs, namely the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Holocene and the third one is Anthropocene. So finally, to, to conclude this unit, paleoclimate is the science dealing with the study of the past climate. So paleoclimatologists, they used climate archives or proxies to unravel the past climate of the earth. So the main important climate archives are historical data, archaeological data and geological record. So the logs of the farmers, dairies of the travelers, ancient inscriptions, newspapers, paintings, the artistic depictions, reports of the early weather, observers and other public records or the source of historical data. So the rock layers, minerals, soil, remains of plants and animals and artifacts are the main sources of archaeological data. Then the geological record consisting of sedimentary rock types, fossils, ice cores and cave deposits. It gives a clue of the past climate. So the Pleistocene epoch starts from 2.58 million years ago and ends at 11,700 years. And it is a period of extensive glaciations, particularly in the northern hemisphere, Antarctica, South America, and mountainous areas of Rockies, Alps, Himalaya, Kilimanjaro, and Mount Kenya. So the Holocene is the epoch where we live. It starts with the end of the Pleistocene and before the present and continues to the present day. It is a warm period during which the humans have significantly altered the Earth's environment. So the Anthropocene refers to the age of man, which describes the geology of humanity and focuses on the cumulative role of humans as geologic and geomorphic agents in altering the Earth's environment by multiple ways. So this is regard to the first unit of block two. So next unit is six and seven, it refers to the climate of the present. So here the unit six, it deals with the indicators of the environment and the instrumental records. So first, let us take up the climate. The climate induced changes have severely impacted various biotic, biotic means living, abiotic means absence of living components of ecosystem. And it has altered the Earth's climatic system. So biotic processes, the living processes, the natural processes, the variations in the solar radiation received by the Earth the tilting of the earth and its orbit around the sun, the plate tectonics and volcanic eruptions, human activities play a vital role in governing the earth's climate system. See, according to World Meteorological Department, climate is the average of weather conditions at a place for at least a period of 30 years. So a deviation in the mean standard of climate for a longer period of time is called as the climate change. 
So there are several internal and external factors that influence and affects the climate of the earth. So first let us take up the internal factors or the internal forcing which helps in the changing of the climate. So the internal forcing or the natural processes that operate within the climate system like the ocean and the atmospheric interactions and interactions among the living components. So the ocean and the atmosphere, they work together and results in internal climate variability that lasts from years to decades. So by redistributing the heat between the deep ocean and the atmosphere and ordering the cloud, water vapor, sea, ice, etc. So there is a circulation of these heat and temperature it affects the global average surface temperature and the total energy budget of the earth so coming to the external force or the external forcing so the anthropogenic impacts the human impacts like increased emission of greenhouse gases and the dust along with the natural processes like changes in solar output earth's orbit volcano eruptions it acts as external forces that affects the climate of the earth so human induced pressures in the form of agriculture land clearance shifting cultivation deforestation urbanization and industrialization have resulted in the increase in the amount of greenhouse gases ozone depletion production of methane and it has an impact on the climate change so the variation in the orbital orbit plays a vital role in governing the climate system of the earth so slight variation in the earth's motion lead to the changes in the seasonal distribution of sunlight reaching the earth's surface and its distribution across the globe so coming to solar output so the ultimate source of energy is the sun, which drives all the physical and biological processes. So the Earth-Sun orbital relationship has a direct impact on the geographical distribution of the sun's energy over the Earth's surface. See, the other sources include the geothermal energy from the Earth's core, tidal energy from the moon, and heat from the decay of radioactive compounds. So both long and short term variations in solar intensity are evidence to affect global climate. So over the time scale of millions of years, the change in solar intensity is a critical factor influencing the climate. So what are plate tectonics? So the movement of the land mass a wide range of time scale, horizontal and vertical displacement of tectonic plates. So the entire globe was divided into a number of plates and due to the movement of these plates, the ocean and the terrestrial area which generated, it showed, uh, which, it affected the global and the local patterns of climate and atmosphere ocean circulation. So how to measure? how to measure this climate change. So there are a number of instrumental records. So in order to understand the dynamics of climate change, it is important to understand the present scenario of climate by studying and absorbing the factors controlling or contributing in climate change. So a number of interdisciplinary studies, interdisciplinary means are the different uh, disciplinary studies like oceanography, meteorology, geomorphology, geology, paleoclimatology, all it gives a good amount of quantitative and qualitative information. So this information along with the observational and instrumental records from different locations help in making the climatic models. So analysis of instrumental records of common climate elements like temperature, rain, humidity, wind, sunshine, atmospheric pressure, etc. It specifies the physical state of the climate at a given place for a certain period of time. 
So there are proxy records also. So we need a various proxies from ancient geological materials to understand the conditions locked up there and the ice cores, tree rings, sub-fossil pollen grains, corals, lake, ocean sediments, etc., gives us a clue of to uh, construct the model. So the proxy records gives an indirect information about the past climate, temperature, rainfall, etc., and each proxy respond variably to the changing climatic scenario, and thus it records the paleoclimate data accordingly. So among the various proxies used in paleoclimate studies, some of the use an annual resolution data includes the tree rings, the speleothems, and corals. See, speleothems, these are the mineral deposits formed in the karstic caves where the water table is significantly lowered and favoring the exchange of air with the atmosphere. Coral reefs have been a part of the Earth's ocean for millions and millions of years, and they are very sensitive to change in the climate. So coral reefs, they are mainly made up of calcium carbonate. So when you extract the calcium carbonate from the coral reefs, so you can see the water temperature and the calcium carbonate densities in the skeletons also changes. So studies shows that the coral formed in the summer has a different density than compared to winter. So this creates a seasonal growth rings on the coral, similar to the rings on a tree. You can see a number of rings on the coral and these rings are used to determine the temperature of the water, the season in which the coral grew and by studying the growth bands, coral samples can be used to know the exact year and season. So to conclude this unit, this unit, so climate change is one of the serious issue being faced by humanity across the globe. So climate change has a wide range of effects on the environment like water sources, agriculture, food security, human health, terrestrial ecosystem, biodiversity, and coastal zones. So in in this regard, multidisciplinary, as I told you, the oceanography, meteorology, geomorphology, geology, it gives a good amount of quantitative and qualitative information. So this information, so along with the observational and instrumental records from different location, it contributes a lot in making productive climatic models. So analysis. Analysis of the instrumental records of common climate elements such as temperature, precipitation, just a minute, so temperature, uh, temperature, then the precipitation, humidity, wind, sunshine, atmospheric pressure provides a useful, useful clue for the physical state of the climate at a given place for a certain period of time. So in general, in general, so climate shows a high spatial and temporal variability. So we have seen the proxies like ice cores, tree rings, fossil pollens, corals, lakes, ocean sediments. It has proved a very useful understanding for the long term vegetation and climate dynamics at the spatial and temporal scale. So this is the second unit, second unit of block two environmental indicators and instrumental records and the seventh unit that is the third unit of block two is human footprints on global warming so this the seventh unit deals with the human footprints on global warming so the human population is one of the major driving factors of ecological footprints. So the disproportionate increase in population resulted in the difficulty in managing the resource depletion and global warming. So the human settlement and their activities interact with the environment in a very complex way. The industrialization, 
deforestation, urbanization, desertification, and stratospheric ozone depletion are the major issues faced globally in the 21st century. And it has resulted from the pressure exerted by the human population to meet their demands. So the five important, the five major issues which are faced globally in this 21st century are industrialization, deforestation, urbanization, desertification, and stratospheric ozone depletion. So first one is the, as you all know, the major problem is the increase in human population. So the each, see the earth has certain capacity. to carry the, the living and the living organisms. So the carrying capacity plays a major role in population growth. So the global population is about 7.6 billion, which is expected to cause 11.18 in 1,100. The addition of 1 billion inhabitants occurred within the last 12 years. So the distribution of the world population in Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean and the Northern America and Oceania was 60%, 17%, 10%, 9%, 6%, and 41%, uh, respectively. So the contribution of China and India was 19 and 18% of the global total population. So the rate of population growth of a country, it depends on the income, the culture, and the geography. So the increase in population since 1980 in low-income countries was 112% in contrast to middle-income and high-income countries with 52% and 23%. So the human and the Earth's climate related by two important factors in the past few decades. So anthropogenic activities, human-used activities, including but not limited to burning of fossil fuels, change in the pattern of land use, agriculture, and industries, they are responsible for emission of greenhouse gases and eventually change in climate. And human communities are more vulnerable to hazards such as extreme high temperature, storms, floods, droughts, resulting from increasing population density in sensitive areas such as river basins and coastal plains. So next is industrialization. So the process of social and economic change of an agrarian society to an industrial society is known as industrialization. So it is related to the development of a country and helped in employment generation, but it has a major role in global warming. So it releases 21% of the greenhouse gases and from the energy consumption, fossil fuel burning, chemical, metallurgical and mineral transformation processes and waste management activities. So the fossil fuel combustion and the global manufacture of cement are responsible for more than 75% of human caused carbon dioxide emissions. So the next important cause is deforestation. So the forest ecosystem has a productive, protective, and regulative functions. They play a main role in maintaining the carbon cycle. So the conversion of forests to non-forest land like arable land, urban use, logged area, or wasteland results in deforestation. So deforestation is the conversion of forest to another land use or the long-term reduction of tree canopy below the 10 percent threshold it contributes directly to greenhouse effect by non-availability of the forest area to sequester to minimize the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere <coughs> according to millennium ecosystem assessment scenarios forest area in developing regions decreases by about 200 to 490 million hectares between 2000 and 2050. 
The removal of forest cover reduces water retention capacity of soil and increases soil erosion. So what are the direct and indirect impacts of deforestation? So as we all know, it causes a change in the climate, the local and global climate. The forest loss and forest degradation increases the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere because most of the plants, they absorb carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere and gives out oxygen by the process of photosynthesis. So the annual absorption of 2.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide released by the fossil fuel burning is absorbed by the plants. The rainfall pattern and the intensity of the rainfall is affected. The deforestation increases drought and desertification, crop failures, melting of the polar ice caps, coastal flooding and displacement of major vegetation regimes. So these are the direct effects. The indirect effects are the habitat loss and the biodiversity. The deforestation is related to the habitat destruction and fragmentation. So the forests which are rich in biodiversity, which acts as a habitat for two-thirds of all the known species, which contains 65% of the endangered species. The habitat loss also increases the human wildlife conflicts. So not only the loss of habitat and the biodiversity, but also the loss of soil and water resources. So the removal of the forest reduces the evapotranspiration and directly affects the water cycle. So the, it influences the water recharge in rivers and other aquatic habitats. So the ultimate result is the scarcity of water for drinking and irrigation. So it also causes a siltation and this heavy siltation increases the riverbeds and cause flooding. So it creates environmental refugees in some parts of the world. So the next cause is urbanization. Urbanization, it is a global phenomenon where there is a transformation of human settlement. So there is a migration of people from rural to urban areas and also the transformation of rural areas into urban areas. So the current percent of total world population that live in urban areas is 55%. So the urban activities are major source of greenhouse gas emissions and rapid growing urban population is more vulnerable to impacts of climate change. See, India has more than 35 cities and this urbanization has affected the climate and it, is, and it causes urban heat effect. So the urban heat effect is due to the increase in the temperature in the urban areas by the waste heat emissions. So the temperature of the urban areas has increased due to the direct heat generation from human activities, removal of vegetation, construction of buildings, roads, and other human transformation of the natural environment. So all this leads to the increase in the global warming. So deterioration in the air quality impacts on the local climate and change in the rainfall or precipitation. The urban flooding, the urbanization causes change in the land use and microclimate, which affects the hydrology and the hydroclimatology of the area which, incre which in increases the frequency and the magnitude of floods due to the climate change. And it causes extreme precipitation and poor infiltration in cities. So the urbanization also affects the rainfall pattern. The cities in the coastal regions or near river deltas are more prone to floods with its urban characteristic as well as from the changes in the sea level, tides, large scale runoff, to rivers. So the factors causing urban flood hazards are meteorological factors, hydrological factors, human factors aggravating the natural flood hazards. So apart from the industrialization, urbanization, deforestation, the particulate matter, which are the suspended solid particles and the liquid particles present in the air in the form of dust, soot, 
smoke liquid droplet it changes in size chain composition origin etc so these are the particles with natural and anthropogenic sources and the natural sources are wildfire sea spray suspension of organic matter vehicular emissions wood smoke emissions etc so the industries like the brickworks refineries cement iron and steel quarrying and the fossil power plants or the sources of this particulate matter so it also contributes in the change of the climate next one is b defined desertification as the land degradation in the arid semi arid and the dry subhumid areas resulting from various factors including the climatic variations the consequences of desertification are reduction in land cover quantity and quality of water crop production carbon dioxide emission increase in wind erosion and formation of gullies it affects the climatic condition in the dry land areas and they are more prone to drought So next is the stratospheric ozone depletion. So the ozone which is present in the stratosphere is considered as a good ozone as it prevents the ultraviolet B radiation to the earth's surface. So the thinning of the ozone layer occurs in the temperate zone and it it's a continuous process during spring times and the ozone pole has been discovered over Antarctica in 1985. and it is more prominent in antarctic than arctic due to the favorable conditions for polar stratospheric cloud formation so the main reasons to deplete this ozone layer is the ozone depleting substances like cfcs hcfcs methyl bromide carbon tetrachloride hydrobromofluorocarbons chlorobromethane etc which are the sources the sources of these the ozone depleting substances are the refrigerants air conditioners foam blowing agents fire suppressors electrical equipment industrial solvents solvents in dry cleaning aerosol aerosol spray propellants and fumigants so the ozone depletion increases the exposure to ultraviolet b radiation so which has a wavelength of 290 to 320 and the uv radiation reaching the earth surface causes the skin cancer melanoma development cataract in human beings the physiological and developmental functions are affected in plants and it disturbs plant competitive balance plant diseases bio geochemical cycles etc so to conclude the third unit third unit yes the human fit footprints human footprints on global warming so human footprints and global warming so to conclude this topic that is the third unit of the block 2 the population growth industrialization and urban expansion increases the emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and increases the global temperature the industrialization and urbanization are the major agents of deforestation the urban design reduced the potential for evaporative cooling and causes urban heat islands with a unique microclimate so the desertification results from the warming up of the earth due to human pressure the stratospheric ozone depletion due to human emitted ozone depleting substances causes uvb radiation exposure to human animals and plants so the climate change and the variability that we observe in the present time it is mainly due to the human activities but limited to deforestation industrialization and urbanization so the last unit of this block is predicting future climate so the unit 5 it it refers to the past climate 6 and 7 to the 
present climate. Eight is predicting future climate based on past and present climate. So as we all know with the human activity, there is increase in the temperature, global temperature. There is a raise in the sea level and submerging of low-lying islands, the loss of biodiversity and shrinking of hotspots all over the world. It has led to the climate change mainly due to the anthropogenic activities. So as a result, scientists all over the world, they are thinking of various strategies to understand the climate change, to gain an insight about its implication and also to quantify the changing climate by means of certain models. See, these models, they attempt to quantify the changing climate by using physical loss of radiation and energy and studying the radiation behavior and flux at the surface of the Earth. So there are regional or global climate models to quantify the extent of change that the Earth is undergoing in terms of climate. And also it includes the clouds and the aerosols in more complex models for understanding their dual role in radiative forcing of the earth, which leads to climate change. So as there is an increase in the temperature, global temperature, so as there are thinning out of the ozone layer, change in the habitat loss, biodiversity, so the scientists across the globe, they are finding out a way to quantify quantify the changing climate and predicting the future climate by means of certain models. So analogs from past climate. See, the analog approach, it is one of the approach of testing the ground reality to the output of this climate model. The analog tool... connects the site that are analogous, analogous and similar, similar to climates at sites across other geographical locations. So implying the climate across space as well as time. For example, a very simple example, if any place in the world has the present climate that is similar to the future predicted climate elsewhere, then these two sites can provide interesting observations on adaptation strategies to be followed for decreasing or minimizing the adverse effect of predicted climate change in the future. So this approach holds true only if climate is the driving force behind the observation in the two sites. So such a comparison between the sites can be used to enable the farmers to develop a knowledge for realizing the future of site-specific agricultural output. So the analog tool coupled with the field studies, it gives a mathematical climate model with existing forum technologies. So climate model is just a model quantitative or qualitative representation of objects or phenomenon. So these computer models simulate the Earth's climate and they are called as general circulation models. So various workers call this climate models as an extension of weather forecasting. So these models represents mathematically the five components of the climate system, namely the atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, cryosphere, and biosphere, which is based on <coughs> physical and chemical principles of thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, radiative transfer, and biological interactions. So these models, it can be used to simulate changes in the temperature, rainfall, winds, and oceanic circulations over a long period of time. So these models, it is based on the assumptions and mathematical algorithms, and it has a certain limitations in simulating the Earth's climate. But of course, these models have improved greatly in the last few years to predict the future climate. 
So these climate models are an important tool for understanding how climate might change based on quantitative and scientific measurements. So there are different types of climate models, so which have been used by IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The two primary models are the Canadian model and the Hadley model project. So these two models are developed in Canadian Climate Center and Hadley Center in the United Kingdom. So energy balance models also, or these are also models which calculate the surface temperature as a variable for climate by considering the balance between the incoming solar energy and outgoing solar energy in the form of heat released back to space. So radiative convective models, it can calculate the temperature and humidity of different layers of the atmosphere. General circulation models, which are also called as the global climate models, it is a 4D model which simulate the climate based on physical laws, the flows of air and water in the atmosphere or the oceans, as well as the transfer of heat. A global climate model, it is a mathematical representation of the major climate system components like the atmospheric component which simulates the clouds and aerosols, the land surface component which, uh, which uh, simulates the vegetation, snow cover and water bodies, the ocean component which simulates the current movement and biogeochemistry and the sea ice component it modulates the solar radiation absorbs and air sea heat and water exchanges coupled atmosphere, ocean, general circulation models, etc. So these are certain models, the climate models of which the two model, these are the primary models like the Canadian model and the Hadley model project. Other than this, you have a number of other models. So discussing with the greenhouse gas emission scenarios, the climate models, they are unable to a factor in the effects of clouds. So different climate models project different values for raise in temperature by next decade or next 50 to 100 years. So this climate models that are unable to take the effect of clouds because the clouds are composed of important greenhouse gas called the water vapor that traps the heat as well as exert cooling effect by blocking the sun's rays from reaching the earth's surface. So therefore, it is not very clear as to which of the dual role these clouds play in modifying the climate. So thus, inclusion of these clouds generates some error in results, which may amount to one to two degree error on a production of 2100. So a second aspect that needs to be taken into account is not only the current amount of greenhouse gases, but also the amount of the greenhouse gases that will be added to the atmosphere due to the anthropogenic inputs. So the IPCC was jointly established by the World Meteorological Organization and UNEP to assess the scientific, technical and socio-economic information relevant for the understanding of the risk of human-induced climate change. So the IPCC has produced a series of comprehensive assessment reports on the state of understanding of causes of climate change its potential impacts and options for response strategies. So IPCC publications have become standard work of reference, widely used by the policymakers, scientists, and other experts. So the greenhouse gas emission scenario described in the report have been used to make the projections of possible future climate change. So the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has described about 40 scenarios which are grouped mainly into four main families, namely the A1, A2, B1 and the B2 families. So A1 family is based on the hypothesis, that is the increased economic growth, the world population and introduction to new and efficient technologies, predicting future climates, etc. mid-century and declines thereafter. 
so like this each model has its own uh, prediction and gives a own separate clues so in order to conclude this topic that is the fourth unit so future predicting the future climate so the increasing average global temperature the rising of sea level and submerging of low lying islands the loss of biodiversity and shrinking of hot spots all over the world have led to the increasing distress about the changing climate the complexity in the climate change it has made the scientists across the world to devise certain strategies to understand the phenomenon of climate change to gain an insight about its implications and also to quantify the changing climate by means of models so these climate models they attempt to quantify the changing climate by using the physical laws of radiation and energy studying the radiation behavior and flux at the surface of the earth so there are variety of models that include regional or global climate models to quantify the extent of change that the earth is undergoing in time in terms of climate and in predicting the future climate so this is all about the block 2 that is global climate past present and the future so there are four units 5 6 7 and 8 so the 5 is the account of the past climate it is also called as the paleo paleo climate which refers to the climate of the past the geolo in order to understand this we have to understand the geological time scale the climate during cambrian the climate during paleozoic and the main types of climate arches so in order to understand the climate the paleo climatologists used climate archives and the proxies the important climate archives are the historical data data and on the past human activity and the rock layers different rock layers minerals and soil data plant and animal remains artifacts etc the geological record is the oldest data when compared to the historic historical and archaeological data which includes the sedimentary rock glacial features fossils ice cores cave deposits etc and next the climate of the quaternary period namely the pleistocene holocene and the anthropocene and this or uh, this is the one we discussed in the first unit that is unit 5 and the second one is the environment indicators and the instrumental records so there are certain internal and external factors which influence and affects the climate of the earth the internal forcing includes the change in the climate within the climate system like ocean and the atmospheric interaction the external forcing includes the anthropogenic the human induced impacts the orbital variation solar output plate tectonics etc the instrumental records the proxy records and the conclusion of this topic and the seventh is the human footprints on global warming so here we are going to study we studied the human population growth industrialization deforestation direct and indirect impacts of deforestation biodiversity and habitat loss loss of soil and water resources urbanization urban flooding particulate matter desertification stratospheric ozone depletion etc so this is the conclusion of the third unit the next one is predicting 
predicting the future climate. So how to predict the future climate? By knowing the present and the past climate. So by certain models which are called as the climate model. So the types of climate models are a number of climate models, but the two primary models are Canadian model and the Hadley model project. Other than this, you have the energy balance model, radiative convective models, then general circulation model, global climate model, uh, coupled atmosphere ocean general circulation model, etc. The greenhouse gas emission scenarios according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they together with the United Nations Environment Program, they assess the scientific, technical and socio-economic information relevant for the understanding of the risk human induced climate change, which divides At the IPCC. It describes the 40 scenarios which are grouped mainly into four main families. So this is about this block that is the global climate, past, present and the future. So in the next class, that is tomorrow, same same time, 6 o'clock. So we shall discuss block 3. Block 3 of the MEV 0 to 1. Again, this block also has... The four units, continuation of this unit in the previous class, that is the day before yesterday class. So we discussed one, two, three, four units of block one. And today we discussed the block two, unit five, six, seven, eight. Tomorrow, block three, that is nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Thank you. Um, Madam, good evening. If they have any questions, they can they can interact. Otherwise, okay.